So my video on Monster of the Week did way better than I thought it would, and that's great. I really should have gone and made a follow-up video much sooner. I hope that I've encouraged some people to give this game a try, and I hope that some people might be interested in some more specific advice on how to run it. Still, given that this game does seem to have a fairly small player base, I'm trying to cast a wide net here. A title that reads 5 tips for running D&D might look ridiculously broad, but I think that it's more appropriate for Monster since it's more focused on a very specific type of story. But if this video does really well, then I might make more focused videos on this game later. For now though, here are 3 tips for running the game, especially for new keepers who are coming from a D&D background, as well as a few of my personal homebrew rules that I think make the game more flexible and fun. Tip number one is to not roll the dice very often. Some people don't like the fact that Monster doesn't have difficulty ratings for moves, other than the odd minus one or minus two penalty that the Keeper can assign for a really difficult task. These people are having trouble losing the D&D mentality, where you need to make a roll for any action that isn't completely trivial. In a PBTA game like Monster, the only time that you need to roll is if you're attempting something in which success and failure are both plausible and narratively interesting. For example, if one of the hunters is trying to pry open a locked door, and they have plenty of time to do it, then they won't need to roll. If they need to do it very quickly, like if there's someone chasing them down, then that's a roll to act under pressure. But if they aren't under any pressure, and it's just a normal door, then they can get it open, no roll required. If there's some supernatural force keeping it shut, or if it requires some specially designed clockwork key, then you also shouldn't roll. You should just describe how they can't open it until some condition is met. The specifics of which they might discover by either picking up on some clues you've laid out, or making a roll to investigate a mystery. Similarly, once a fight starts, not every attack requires a roll to kick ass. If one of the hunters is shooting from afar, then they can probably just inflict damage equal to the weapon's harm rating and describe it in the narration. That said, as a keeper, you're then free to respond by having the monster run around a corner and out of the gunman's sights forcing the hunter to get in close if they want to keep fighting. But none of that requires a roll of the dice. Besides making the game flow more quickly, going light on die rolls will make sure that the hunters don't level up too quickly. Five failed rolls for each level up isn't that many, and if the hunters are rolling to go to the bathroom, then they might end up checking off all the advancement options long before the campaign's over. Tip number two is to never be afraid to split the party. I know that this is a massive departure from D&D, where the phrase never split the party is so ubiquitous and memeified that I'm sure some non-role players are probably familiar with it. And in that game, it's easy to see why, since getting into a fight with half your party missing is usually an easy way to die. And also because given the complexity of D&D's combat system, having to switch between multiple encounters and multiple locations can be a slog for the players and a headache for the dungeon master. This isn't the case in Monster. The game is fast paced enough that a scene with just one or two of the hunters usually won't drag on for too long. And combat is much more about knowing the monster's weakness than it is about sheer numbers on either side. Even if a hunter gets cornered by a monster when no one else is around, they'll usually have luck points to spend, or maybe an escape related move to prevent them from getting murked. They might get captured, scarred, or cursed, but that's great for raising tension in your game. When you really think about it, having the party sticking together all the time is nothing more than a gameplay limitation in more complex systems. There are endless possibilities for dramatic turning points that hinge on not all of the players being there to see a threat. Maybe the mundane catches a glimpse of a spirit that vanishes before the expert can identify it, or a demon shows up to offer the crooked a deal without the other party members to tell him no. There are also countless non-violent ways to split the party as well. Whether direct, like having one of the hunters step on a teleportation circle, or having a long-lost friend call a hunter to a private meal. Or they can be less direct, like if the hunters are looking for werewolf tracks and won't be able to search the whole town before nightfall unless they split up. All I'm saying is that there's a lot to be gained by splitting up your players, and that you should keep it in your toolbox regardless of how D&D has conditioned you. The last of my three tips is to use real-world mythology and folklore as inspiration for your monsters. Even if it's still ultimately make-believe, urban fantasy can feel much closer to reality than fantasy set in entirely imaginary worlds. And your campaign will especially feel more immersive if you base your supernatural elements around what people used to actually believe, and in some cases still believe. 
Then, if your creatures are mostly based on tertiary sources that are far removed from the mythology that inspired them. The kobolds you'll find in a D&D monster manual are absolutely nothing like the mischievous household sprites of German folklore from which they get their name. And the Wendigo was originally a very specific metaphor for the dangers of cannibalism. But nowadays, it's often generalized to mean any scary creature that lives in the North American woods. You certainly don't need to limit yourself to ancient and medieval myths. Urban legends can be fantastic pieces of inspiration, and if your campaign has a road trip vibe like Supernatural, then you should research supposed hauntings and cryptids associated with the area that the hunters are traveling to. This will especially make an impact if your players are aware of these legends, but even if they aren't, primary and secondary sources are less likely to seem contrived and likely better at selling the idea that there really could be monsters lurking around any corner. If you want to change some things from the version that you've read, then that's fine. Very few myths stay consistent over thousands of retellings and reinterpretations, so it's not like there's one single story that you need to stay true to. Still, there are some things that you should see as being less malleable than others. If your creature or concept is tied closely to an actual religion that's still widely practiced today, and you've never followed that religion, then it's probably best to leave it alone. It's possible that you can adapt it respectfully enough to satisfy members of that religion, but I'm not remotely qualified to talk about that sort of thing, so I'll leave it at that. Still, there are a ton of super interesting creatures that don't touch any of those thorny issues, enough to make a video about later. If you already have ideas for monsters that are entirely of your own creation, then you can use those all you want, those can be great too. But if you're looking for inspiration, then I think it's generally a better idea to look at folklore and mythology than contemporary pop culture. So that's it for general advice. Now we're moving on to homebrew rules, and my first one is to let your players use a point by system when choosing their character's ratings. The fact that you need to choose a predetermined set of ratings for your character is needlessly restrictive, especially because in some cases, all five options have the same rating for one of your attributes. The Initiate always starts with plus 2 Weird, and the Mundane always starts with plus 2 Charm. What if I want to play an Initiate whose order considers magic to be evil, or a Mundane who's a socially awkward nerd? Sure, many of the Initiate moves rely on Weird, and many of the Mundane moves rely on Charm, but not nearly all of them. The solution to this is simple, allow the players to assign whatever ratings they want, as long as they total plus 3, and none of them are below minus 1 or higher than plus 2 though with the exception of the monstrous, which can have plus 3 weird. Sure, the keeper should look over this, and there are some cases where a given playbook really does need to be tied to a certain rating without many exceptions. The expert should always have high sharp, and the spooky should always have high weird. But for the most part, choosing the equivalent of ability scores should be much more flexible than choosing a predetermined list. House rule number two is more of an expansion of an official alternate rule than a rule of my own design, and it has to do with the move Investigate a Mystery. If you ask me, the permitted questions for this rule as written are overly specific, and they certainly don't cover every scenario that the hunters might be looking into. For example, if the hunters come across a strange rune carved into a wall, none of these questions can really tell them what that rune represents. The alternate version of the rule in the Tome of Mysteries is much better, which allows you to ask one general question on a 7 to 9, and either two general questions or one specific question on a 10 or higher. My spin on this rule is that yes or no questions count the same as general questions, but they have to be answered with a yes or a no. For example, you could ask if a given creature is hurt by silver, but you would only get a yes or no answer. Asking for a specific answer of what the creature is weak to would require a 10 or higher. My final house rule is an entire custom move, keep a secret. As the name suggests, Monster of the Week is about tracking down and killing monsters, and I haven't forgotten that. But in all of the games that I've run, the monster hunting has been served with a generous side of drama between player characters. This is absolutely in keeping with the shows that inspired the game. Even though they're on the same team, Sam and Dean, Buffy and Willow, Mulder and Scully, these people quite often don't get along with each other. So here's a custom move for when your character doesn't feel like opening up to one of their teammates. When you withhold information from a fellow hunter, roll plus charm or plus cool, whichever is higher. On a 10 plus, you don't reveal anything. On a 7 to 9, you accidentally answer one of these questions in conversation, your choice. On a 6 or less, it's the same as above, but the other player chooses the question. 
And the options are, why are you keeping this a secret? What sort of evil might the secret involve? What does the Inquirer know that might be a key to the secret? Or what is the short, bastardized, but still technically accurate version of the secret? For as long as I've used this rule, it's done a great job facilitating character development, and I've been surprised by how much drama can come from characters just not opening up to one another. It can especially help keep a sense of continuity in a game where the external conflicts are often purely episodic in nature. Still, you should remember that this game is about fighting monsters first and character drama second, since that's what most of the rules support. If you want to play an urban fantasy game that's all about messy relationships, with adventure being more of an afterthought if it exists at all, then you might want to check out Monster Hearts. The rules are very similar to Monster of the Week, and while I haven't played it because the concept isn't really for me, I've heard great things about it. So yeah, there's some basic advice and a few homebrew rules that'll hopefully enhance your experience as a keeper. Let me know if you have anything to say about this in the comments, or if you'd like to see more videos about this system. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.